Hey, what's going on guys? Mike, Phil Craft Survival. We have uh, two special guests today at Ready Gunners Range in Utah. Um, I always like to come here and isolate, do content with friends, uh, the content we provide with you guys. And these guys are VIPs who are doing uh, a lot of training around the US as well as a product lineup. And they're the right guys to teach me some new tactics because even guys with my background and experience need to be willing to learn. Uh, without further ado, I got DJ and Cole from GBRS. What's up, guys? No, how's it awesome going? Thanks for having yeah. us. Yeah. Thanks, for, thanks for taking the time, man. Sure, I mean, you guys you. are East Coast based NASOF guys and uh, uh, no longer on active duty, but you guys have a new purpose in duty and teaching and doing all the stuff that you do. What are you guys doing with GBRS right now? Knowledge transfer, soft and hard goods, product development. Yeah. Trying to make a better mousetrap and everything we uh, thought over the last 20 years was a sticking point or wasn't exactly what we needed, or the modifications behind it have kind of been lost in translation over the last you know, 10 years. Yeah. So if we can make it 10% better, let's make it 10% better for the end user. So everything's with the end user in mind and everything we do. Yeah, these guys um, don't typically advertise this. I will for them professionally, but career Navy guys that both medically retired, um, but also guys that have a decade in a tier one Navy version known as development group. And that operational experience is what's giving them uh, the ability to give these guys like law enforcement and military that they're training the edge because those are real world uh, operational lessons learned often made with mistakes and blood. And, and that's a huge opportunity for, I think the industry as a whole, which is why I got these guys here to teach me. I think it's important to uh, pay attention to that because that's super relevant. I mean, I tapped out five years ago and that feels like in the tactical space, like Vietnam, like I'm like a Vietnam guy and these guys are like modern GWAT guys. What we wanted to do for you today is kind of have Navy SEALs train a Green Beret in the transition of a Glock pistol, which is all I shot my military career, um, and then into a SIG. Uh, I'm new to SIG, but I'm on board because it feels right. I don't know if it shoot, shoots right because I've only used the 320 X carry, but now I got their new hotness, a full size 320 that I just put in the holster last night um, that I'm willing with these guys' experiences and working with SIG um, to, to have them teach me from the ground up. So I, I think it'd be pretty entertaining to, to do that, but also very beneficial for me and you guys at home watching the content. Uh, so I'm ready, you guys ready? Yeah. I'm All right, let's kick it off. Cool. All right, guys, I, I've never, so, I've never put a round through this gun in its full size. I don't even know the model of gun this is. Um, it's it's Max Michelle's 320 competition gun. Uh, so I'm assuming it's forgiving, but don't know a lot about the gun and that's on purpose. We are gonna do a video on me unboxing a gun and shooting it for the first time, but even better opportunity with DJ and Cole to learn out of the box kind of uh, assessing uh, the transition in a gun from a Glock to a SIG. So I'll just hand it over to you, man, and whatever you want to do, I mean, I'm game. So first we started with the SIG. Had the entire career, started in buds all the way through. I didn't have a handgun background growing up. Yeah. Most people don't. Yeah. That's a very hard gun, I feel, to learn on. With yeah. that double action trigger, it's a very long trigger pull. So the first one was basically just to cock it. Yeah. And then we go from there. We had to make a, a hard transition to the Glock from the SIG. And I feel that grip angle, when we did it, I was always aimed high. I always had to drop it. So the school of thought is I'm driving it out and now I have to level it before my first shot. So as I'm prepping the trigger and driving it out, that's what we had to do for Glock. For SIG, it feels more natural to me when I drive it out in the eye line, but yeah. it's really finding the trigger. I feel the trigger is uh, it's very different from Glock to SIG. Not better, not, not worse, just it's different and it's worth the conversation. Yeah. So the trigger prep, the trigger reset, and then driving out into your eye line, knowing you don't have to level it much. So we make the stance and everything the same. We drive it out to figure out where the actual breaking point is, the sweet spot, yep. and then how far to reset instead of coming all the way off. Yeah. I feel because of the weight of the SIG, for whatever anomaly, people come all the way off for the reset and then reacquire. Um, yeah. And that obviously it messes up for a follow-up shot. Yeah. So, so firing through the manipulation, the trigger reset, and then um, kind of getting used to the trigger because it's so different and the weight of the gun itself it yeah. weighs more like, dude i noticed that i mean i, I grew up in ipsic and uspsa 
and and some of my open guns are like heavy and and you're like well, why would you use a heavier gun it just feels more balanced as you're driving it you could almost rail the gun evenly versus that polymer which is like you know, whoa it's, it's completely different it feels like if i squeeze it hard enough i'm gonna break it yeah, or i'm gonna break myself it, yeah. and then we talk about guys because I mean, most guys in special operations are in the military i mean you're not a packet of peanuts you're a full-size human yeah. you've got a full-size hand and if i drop a glock 19 into it my pinky has nowhere to go yeah so a full-size yeah. frame I like the weight of it. It helps me manage recoil better. Yeah. And I know I have a gun in my hand. Like it makes me feel connected to it. So we do a blind test. We bring in new clients. We line up everything down the road. We just pick them up until you get to the one where in your mind, you've never, you don't have any pistol background, no experience. Stop when you hit a pistol that that's what it feels like. Most people stop on a SIG. They do when they grab it and their eyes are closed and like, that's what I thought a pistol would feel like. The weight of it, the balance. I like that. I'm gonna steal that. Try that. Like I, I like. The, so I, I teach based on hand size, where I say, hey, if you if you're picking a gun because it's smaller or because it looks cooler, you're making a mistake. And most people make that mistake, and then they have to work through it, and then they don't feel comfortable in everyday carry, and and then when they figure out the gun they actually want, it just saves them a lot of time and money if they just do that in advance. Oh, you do that at your, at your training courses, like yep. the, the blind test? Bring them all in, and then you get some guys who are super experienced, and they're shooting, but they're not shooting at their full potential, and it's because they've got these huge meat hooks, yeah. and the gun is just too small. I'm like, yeah. shoot a Glock 17, and they crush it. Yes. You give them a 34, they crush it even more. Yeah. They put a magwell on, even better. Yeah. It's like, now switch over to something you don't have to level, yeah. switch over to a SIG and drive it out, and they, they shoot better. I know I do. Yeah, um, I do for sure. Yeah. What's your feedback, Cole? I mean, you talked about um, kind of that fit and what feels good. Um, I hate to say it, but aesthetics are still part of that selection because I know plenty of guns that shoot really good and look ugly as shit, and that's I will true. not carry it. Well, that's why I'm a fan of SIG too. I mean, the the yeah. agency SIG that you showed me, it just looks proper, right? And and it, I mean, one, it's worn. It's got like patina on it because you guys run those guns like tools, like they should be run. But um, there's something to that, man. Because I mean, there's like there's a reason High Point's not doing so well, uh, just generally speaking. I mean, even like wear and tear on the gun. Like we have our boxes, big sixteen sixty. I take that pistol and I throw it in the box, just like I did in the military. If it breaks inside of the box, it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. It's like we have to torture test it, but a realistic torture test. Yeah. I don't need to run over with a truck. I need to be able to drop it, throw it in a box for six months, and yeah. does it still hold zero? Yeah. Does it feel natural when I shoot it? And does it feel like how a pistol should feel? Yeah. Like, I know plenty of guns that don't. I drive them out and it does not feel right and I can't perform right. Yeah, we, for sure. We've talked about picking the right tool for the right problem or however you want to use that. I can't speak highly enough about SIG because of the modularity of it. You pull the trigger module out, like you want to carry, have a, a little bit smaller frame slide. Yeah. Same trigger module. Yeah. You're just swapping that out. It's like a transformer. Need. Yeah. So for me, like I love this X5 Legion. I like a big, heavy gun. I got yeah. a big hand, I like a big, heavy gun. That carry model they made, yeah. that's the best of both worlds. I drop the, the actual FCU, I drop yeah. it in, and now I've got multiple platforms, and, but I like to dress around the gun. When I conceal carry, yeah. I throw on a big overgarment, like I can hide, I can hide a full-size gun. Yeah. And when I pull it out, like that's my thing. I can't run, I can't run a very small pistol, like um, yeah. a Glock 43X. No, yeah. I, I can't, and I won't bet my life on that. Yeah. If you and me were to get in a gunfight right now in the next room and you handed me a Glock 43, I'm like, shit. Like, so I'm not weird, giving you my best foot forward. Weird true story is I pulled a Glock 43 on a guy in California and uh, hiding behind my A-pillar after he was trying to get out and, and like he was going to pull a gun. After that incident, when I was, I mean, it, it, I didn't shoot the dude. It, was, it wasn't a self-defense act. The dude was a gangbanger. He pulled over. He threatened to have a gun. I pulled the gun in my car behind my A-pillar. After that thing, that feeling I had overwhelmingly was I don't ever want to have that gun in my hand again because it was too small. The magazine capacity was too too small. And I'm used to, in GRS, carrying a Glock 17 full size. And on a bigger guy like us, we can get away with that. And it felt right uh, to transition back into a full size gun that I'm used to shooting on the flat range teaching, but also that I could just transition into carry. So how, let me see how big your hand is. Yeah, same. So, and the, I'm assuming, yeah, oh, so, yeah. same. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's like the the, the, the end, one end all be all solution for a specific gun for a specific person doesn't exist because it depends on the the mission. 
like, what is your intent? Is it home defense, self-defense, the truck gun, um, shooting on a flat range? I like guns and utility and that modular adaptability is sick. I feel like it's a SIG commercial, yeah. um, but but I like that because, you know, I'm I'm getting more in bed with SIG because I want to help advance equipment and the guys that are advancing equipment, Dan Horner and, and Lindsay and all these guys, um, they're doing so from experience, which is why I think, um, I mean, this, this video should be called um, Navy SEALs convince Green Beret to shoot sick. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, and, yeah, you guys yeah. use two, two sixes, right? Yeah, we did. But it was double action, single action. It was. Whoa. And then we, we transitioned now to the 320 and it's like, that was the best blend they could have done. Cause yeah. everybody wanted to strike a fire. Everybody wanted to Glock for reliability and just the economy of motion and shooting it. And I wasn't a believer. We never had Glock until yeah. my last four years yeah. in the military. Yeah. And then when we shot that, we got it, but I couldn't run that Glock. Wouldn't want to bet my life on it. I just yeah. shot a SIG better. I, yeah. I just my, did. My Glock 19, um, 22, or 36 is what we use in the military, even 34s. Um, and they spent a lot of time during my time period in SR25 mag pouches tucked away. Yep. Because there's no, in my job in reconnaissance and being a sniper in the SIF, I was on containment. So there's just no idea that it was like, I need to be ready for that transition. And so it was just stowed away, tucked nicely. But if you're an assaulter, if you're an operator kicking indoors, uh, if you're a police officer, if you're everyday carry, you're worried about self-defense, you need that comfortable, ready to go pistol. And that, so I, that, I feel like it was a long digression, but I think it's pertinent to the video yeah, about um, what we're about to do. Because yeah. like I said, uh, this isn't for fake. We didn't rehearse anything. I've actually, I've drawn this pistol with Julian yesterday three times after I mounted it while I was just shooting the shit with Julian. I don't even have draw, like nothing. This is cold. So let's do it. Yeah. So for me, um, I like to find, call it admin. I like to just find the trigger breaking point. Yeah. So clear and safe. There's nothing in there. Good. Yep. So high in the purchase, try to figure out exactly where that wall is going to be. Yep. Straight to the rear, but feel it. So one pound, two pound, three. I can feel it right on the hinge point. Like it's about to go. I need to know where that is. Because on the drive out, I need to go straight to the wall. Got like, it. I like to be at that point, at full arms extension in my eye line. I can break the shot or not break it. Yeah. But I feel like too many guys wait for full extension and then try to send it and you get that. Huge discrepancy. Yeah. Guys, even when they dry fire or dry practice, they practice drawing the, holster, the gun from the holster and they practice doing that. Yeah. And I'm like, your fingers extended on the frame. You're not a police officer who's mitigating risk because you're, you're, you're pulling the gun saying, show me your hands. You're pulling that gun because it's self-defense. Yeah. And so you're saying, prep the trigger, find the wall on find this wall. pistol so I know where it's, okay, let's do so that. Find that multiple times and really to find the reset. So I'm safe. So admin, we try to figure out exactly where it is. It's right at the wall, one pound, yeah. two pounds slow. That's super short it compared, is. like, I'm used to all the slack and garbage in exactly. my stock. And if you go in there with that kind of attitude, you'll take the first shot and you'll break it premature because you're used to a long wall. Yeah. You're used to find it and it's not there. It's very crisp. Oh. So you break it all the way to the rear and lock it to the rear. Yeah. Feel the reset, how short that is. And then right back to the wall. Oh, so like half the reset exactly. length of a Glock. So if you went in with the Glock mindset, I feel like you take out too much slack, you break the shot premature and then you reset too far out. Yeah. It's a very short wall, especially with that gun being Max Michelle's. He needs a short reset for the follow-up shots. Wow. Okay. But the weight of that gun, the balance of it, and the trigger reset, I mean, it's a stock trigger. There's nothing done to that. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I'm not used to that because I'm used to all the grinding that I would feel yep. in a Glock. And then when it resets, it's so immediate. Yep. It's like I, I move my finger out and I immediately find the reset yep. versus searching, there it is, and then I'm on it. Yeah, I feel like on a, on a Glock or any... Anything else, even on um, on a HK DP9, we've got a bunch of those. I feel like that reset, I'm waiting, 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 waiting. There it is, Oh, and I have to reacquire all that back. Yeah. With this, we don't have to, but I feel like the grip angle, yeah. it's more natural. So if we drive it out in our eye line, we shouldn't have to level it, it should come in the eye line. Yep. And if we manage the trigger prep and the trigger reset, we've already got the grip established, we've got that vice grip. We're not yeah. deviating left or right, up or down. We're pulling trigger straight to the rear. Yeah. It shoots very flat. Well, that, I've noticed that too about what you said about finding the eye line is the, the SIG frame is higher. Yeah. So it sits taller. So it's in my eye line with my hands under where a Glock would be, where I'm typically up in my field of view. 
now I'm just like right below it, which is a difference too as well. I also like the built-in beaver tail. For me, um, I mean, we've got scars all cut in there from shooting blocks in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, because I grip so high on the gun, that's what we teach, super high, we get Glock bite. With this, when I get that full-size purchase yeah. and I get in the meat of my hand, I feel like it's so much easier to control. Yeah, it's so far away. Yeah. Usually a Glock would be ripping. I mean, I got the same thing. Look at that right there. Yeah. I got the same thing as Scar right there. That's crazy. And then something else, like uh, for the backplate shooting, that little notch right there, when we're teaching instinctive shooting and everything else, yeah. like on Glocks, you know, people put a Punisher skull or something like that. Yeah. We do backplate shooting for exiting out of vehicles, inside of crowds, the instinctive, the, the very violent shit. That is a very easy button to find. Awesome. But when you drive that out and you backplate it on a pistol, it becomes natural and that becomes a secondary aiming device. Yeah. So we stripped off irons. We don't run them because inside of uh, what we do now, yeah. we don't need to. Okay. All right. So uh, let me ask you one more question that will kind of extend the video on this as a part one um, because it's super interesting. There's, there's something that I got attacked with uh, years ago when I was teaching pistol uh, to civilians. Um, because I've been in instances in the house killing bad guys where, you know, we're doing a soft clear after a call out and bad guy is there and oh crap, bad guy. And after it's all said and done, I'm like, I never snapshotted my Yotech. I never saw the dot. That happened routinely, not routinely, but it happened a lot. And I was like, wait a minute. Why does everybody get so butthurt about Mike? Why are you teaching instinctive reflexive? And what I've realized is it's probably nomenclature, it's name, because uh, every officer that we've interviewed, plus a hundred guys, have always said in an immediate threat, against an immediate threat, they never had time to find their front sights because their eyes were obviously target focused because that's where they saw the behavior or indication of deadly force they, they flipped on. And, and the timing constraint. How do you teach it? Uh, you use the word instinctive and, and you use backplate shooting, which I've never heard before, which, I, cause I've heard, I teach alignment and I say, Hey, like Dan Horner would teach Dan Horner last year, a podcast and I said, Hey, out of all the championships you won, cause he won everything he shot. Um, I competed in the use of sock sniper company with my ass and he's not even a sniper, which yeah. sucks. I did third though. I did really, I did, I got a gun, but he said, I said, how many targets did you transition your field of view or your field of focus from target to front sight out of all the targets? One, he won every, every cop he shot. And he said it was a 27 yard pie plate, six inches wide. And it was a gun he wasn't familiar with, probably the NRA championship. Hmm. And, and I'm like, how come we are not teaching this? And then how come when guys like me or you say something about this, the industry or players in the industry go, what are you doing? And I get the liability aspect, but I also want to train to reality. What's your, what's your whole take on that? Exactly that reality. The reality is that very few people can keep it switched on at 100%, so you, it becomes a reaction. It becomes, out of all the house runs you've done, 95% was kind of benign. Like there wasn't a dude in that corner, you didn't have to shoot people at every single room, and when you do, it's a lot of reaction. It's a lot of reflex responses, so if we make the stance the, the same, the grip the same, if I look exactly where I want to go and I drive it in my eye line, I feel it becomes like shooting a spitball. I don't have to know how to shoot a spitball, I point my nose where I want it to go, it's in line with my sternum, my belly button, my center line, and I can hit what I want to. So if we make it all the same and I drive it out and I trust it, and I use this back plate, so that back plate, I superimpose dead center because that is directly in line with the board. That's where the round is leaving. So if I put that directly over the A and I break the shot straight to the rear, I don't deviate left or right or up and down, it'll go there. And it's and, and you're using that reference in the background of your vision. So that's, um, man. So like even taking the window of the actual optic, if I would take that moon and crest it, right here, I know where it's going. Like it's a mathematical formula from where the bullet is to there. I know where it is. Yeah. And if I don't deviate, if I make everything the same, even in a reflex response, if I lean back and everything is shitty and I drive it straight out into my eye line, I'll hit it. And it's the same thing with a carbine. So we get into a lot of situations in CQB where you might have to present a carbine where you don't have an eye line. You can't, but you have to be able to make that shot at a moment's notice. So we mess around with grip to give yourself essentially a different optic. I can use my fingers and I can make that essentially a rear notch on my support grip and I put you in between that and I hit you. So I can drive it up and snap three or four shots. This is my aiming device, my two fingers around the forward grip. Yep. That is my aiming device. Can we do it long enough and there is no excuse, there is no redo. There is no, ah shit, time out. L let me go back and acquire this. Yeah. You can't, you have to train for it. 
and I'm a realist, like inside of 20 feet, it's a big flash, it's a funny face, and you have to be able to react super fast. So yeah. if we make it all the same, you come to the range, you can burn a lot of reps, a lot of realistic reps that are, we call them universals. They all translate to everything else. No, I mean, I think when you're talking about with the industry that kind of balks at the idea of instinctive shooting, I mean, we talk about connecting uh, training with reality. Um, I would beg to ask the question of, I mean, you're talking about a theory, connect reality to it. You're saying in a defensive posture where you're fighting for your life, you paused and aimed because either you didn't feel comfortable, like, oh, you didn't, oh, okay. So we're talking with reality, like real people that have experienced a real thing. And this is not a beginner move. This is like years of training, years of confidence, like years of just banging perfect reps. We have that confidence. If I do need to take that hit shot, I'm comfortable I can take it from here. I may take a little pause, but if I'm fighting for my life, I know I can empty an entire mag in that day zone with my right hand, offhand. But that's because of my training. You just gotta burn the rest. So it's, it's good to see the Navy backing the Army on this because I've, I've, I've actually been attacked by the firearms industry in a lot of ways for teaching <clears> that. <throat> and the only people who have backed me are guys like Kyle Lamb, who've done it for real, right? Um, Jamie Caldwell. Uh, who's done it for real, uh, uh, one minute out uh, is this company, Viking Tactics, is Kyle Lambs. But um, it, man, that's good to see. And and it's not like it's like, hey, do instinctive shooting, do reflexive shooting, and don't pr practice it as a default. It's not, it, we're saying understand it's a thing and it's likely to happen. What I tell my students is you could not believe me and you'll do it anyway because you want to live. I mean, the bottom line is you want to live. So when that gun's in line, even if it's not in line, suppression's a tactic because we don't go ambush three o'clock. Where's the bad guy? Where's the bad guy? Oh, there he is. We want to change the psychology of the gunfight. So we start sending rounds in suppression and we're not on target. We're suppressing the bad guy, changing the psychology. And I'm not advocating for suppression of bad guys, but it's very simple to understand. If you identify a threat and it's an immediate threat, meaning it's like two tenths away from breaking in your ass, you don't have the time. And I love that. I love that. So one of the things, um, the verbiage behind it, instinctive shooting, they get kind of caught yeah. up with it. Yeah. We're trying to do a word play. I'm like, I'm not doing anything, but it's confirmation of my fundamentals, my grip, my stance, my head position, my side alignment, and my drive out. I don't need the sights at a certain range. And if I drive them out exactly like how I pressed, it's with the red dot and the red dot is not there, I should hit exactly where I pointed. Yeah. Exactly where I look at. So if I look at the head box and I drive out to it and I break the shot and I don't hit it, there's something wrong in my foundation. Yeah. Something wrong with my stance, my head position. Maybe I lean too far forward. Maybe I tomahawk chop. Maybe I bolded in position, but I, I didn't drive it out in my eye line. I didn't break the trigger straight to the rear. I did something. Yeah. Something in my foundation is messed up and we can isolate it pretty fast. I love you it. stand right behind the student and I cut him in half, drive the gun straight out and you'll see. Some guys drive it out and they swing through. Yeah. They're cross-eyed dominant. They've got something going on that it might not be bad, but is it repeatable? Because if you have something, like if you have a weird draw stroke, you have something under duress, it'll break down. Yeah. So we try to simplify the entire process knowing that it's fucking scary, man. Like being shot at inside of 20 feet, inside of whatever, it's dangerous, man. Yeah. It's super scary. You're going to have buck fever. It's like, it's like everything else. You don't want to be overcome by events, but it happens. So yeah. if you can put the pressure Even on Even the best now, in the world. Absolutely, yeah. dude. Scared shitless. Look yeah. when it happens. Yeah. It's real. And I think having the conversation with people that have actually done it, we shouldn't get a lot of flack for it. Like, you've yeah. never done that. Like, we all have. Yeah. Like, it is, it is instinctive shooting. Like, that's what you have to train for. Because you have to put weapons in very awkward situations and positions to cover your mate's back. You have to. And you have to be able to break that shot inside of .25. You have to, natural human reaction, 0.25 seconds, I have to go right now. Yeah. You make the move, we gotta go. I mean, the situation dictates the reaction. Yeah. I mean, how many times you sat there on a flat range and be like, all right, on the buzzer, I'm gonna draw and shoot you. You're you're moving, you're not static. Like, it's a two-way Do you have a groceries in your hand? Do you have your kid in your hand? Are you holding your wife's hand? Maybe you don't even have a chance to get a two-handed grip, but it's a tool to use for the right situation. It may not be for everybody. But I mean, I'd much rather, I always hated having to tell the leadership or tell a teammate, no. Like, can you make that shot? Yeah. Can you pick that up? Yeah. Can you jump over that wall? Yeah. Can you make that shot? Yeah. I don't want to have to hit the excuse matrix. Like, why didn't you take that shot? The red dot wasn't there. The what? 
it's not even it's not even <laughs> vocabulary. No, yeah. there is no excuse at this. Like yeah. we have to. It's gunplay. It's dangerous, and your life depends on my ability to break that shot or not. Like at a certain level, they pay you to take the shot. They really pay you to not take the shot. Yeah. The process of speed, everything in there. It's yeah. like if I'm just overcome by events and I don't prep that trigger and I jerk it, I'm mm-hmm. going to miss. I'm going to miss by a lot. Yeah. So we have to be able to work through all the steps. Like I, I feel like it, it, it's, it drives home that, that point of mastering the basics. I mean, this is an advanced talk. This is going, oh, we got to be disciplined to go. Let's let's not do all these things that we think the, the cartwheels and the ninja school doesn't exist. Let's back up a little bit and just pay attention and focus consciously on the basics. And that's like the mastering of that is why these guys are the best in the world, man. And, and, and my army uh, counterpart uh, unit guys uh, as well. Um, I'm going to give you blue balls on this video today. We're going to use this as part one. And if you're interested, you saw the counter and you're like, they haven't gotten to it yet. There's only one minute left. How's this going down? Well, we're going to give you part two of this because um, I, I could have edited this and chopped it down, but dude, we'd be losing a lot of experience and institutional knowledge that's very important for you guys to understand. And I love the chat about it. So part one, subscribe. Make sure you go to GBRS's website below in the links. Uh, their Instagram is below as well. Uh, set your notifications and also subscribe to their YouTube channel, which are pushing to do more cross-pollinated content, uh, especially with these experiences that we're talking about. And uh, we hope you guys are staying in and staying tuned. Uh, Until next time, I'll see you guys at part two.